Greg, let's talk about meteo tsunamis. This was a new term for me and I'm a meteorologist. So I feel like maybe I missed out on something in my education along the way, or maybe this is a relatively new term. That's why I want to talk to you about this. So can you tell me what this is and how it's different from a regular tsunami? Meteo tsunamis are um, called meteo tsunamis because they have similar characteristics to traditional, more traditional seismic tsunamis. So tsunamis caused by things like underwater earthquakes or volcanoes or landslides. Um, and, and they're similar because they're long waves. So not like the waves that most people see at the beach, you know, which might be like 10 seconds long. Um, media tsunamis and, and seismic tsunamis last anywhere from a couple of minutes up to maybe a couple of hours. Um, so they can be much longer rises and falls in, in water level. And then, the, you know, they also impact large areas. So you know, seismic tsunamis in some cases impact the entire globe. Um, they're, you know, huge events. Media tsunamis are a little more localized, but they can still affect, you know, for instance, um, most of the East Coast with one event. We've had events that might impact um, from North Carolina up to Maine, for instance. Um, so, so media tsunamis can be quite large. So they're, they're very similar to seismic tsunamis, but caused by the weather or the atmosphere instead of you know, um, land underwater. How does the weather cause this giant wave? Great question. So, so usually you can have it from a few different causes. Um, the, the kind of the most common is from summertime thunderstorms, uh, and what you can end up having is um, uh, you know typically fast moving storms. Uh, associated with those storms is often a pressure change, so a change in atmospheric pressure um, that can occur you know pretty abruptly. And as the storm is moving along the water that change in pressure causes a wave on the water surface. And, and initially that wave might only be a few inches um, and so not very large, but if the storm is moving at just the right speed, um, the, the wave uh, ends up feeling the bottom of the ocean and the, the depth of the ocean influences how fast that wave is moving. And when you get the wave moving at the same speed as the, your storm, you keep feeding energy into that wave. So it started at maybe a few inches, it can grow up to maybe a few feet. Um, and then as that wave moves away from the storm and approaches land, it can grow even further as it gets into shallow water. And then as it gets into like estuaries or bays and you can get amplification um, up to, you know, in some cases in the Mediterranean, they've observed media tsunamis at 15 feet or higher. Uh, so they can get quite large. In the U.S., you know, larger waves are more on the order of four or five feet in that range, uh, but big enough to potentially, you know, cause problems. Regular tsunamis are more common on the West Coast, correct? Are these more common on the East Coast because of the continental shelf and the difference there? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we well, we see them uh, quite frequently on the East Coast uh, because of the combination of the, you know, the weather systems. Um, and the, sh the continental shelf, like you're saying, uh, you know, when we did some research a few years ago, we found around 25 meteor tsunamis per year occurring on the East Coast, which kind of blew, blew my mind when we first saw that, um, with the catch being that, you know, most of them are very small, uh, less than, less than two feet tall. Um, and, and, and so people often wouldn't notice them. Uh, there's only about a one per year we observed that exceeded two feet. And, and those are kind of the levels where you might start seeing impacts. Uh, you also see a ton of media tsunamis in the Great Lakes, uh, dozens per year, uh, and in the Gulf of Mexico as well. So, so really around the U.S., uh, they're kind of due to the depth of the water and the movement of storm systems tend to be very, very favorable for media tsunami formation. Hmm. So when were media tsunamis discovered and how were they discovered? So people have known about media tsunamis for, for quite some time, since the, the middle of the, uh, the 1900s or so. Um, there was actually a media tsunami event uh, that was well documented in the Great Lakes in 1954, uh, which uh, in, in, in Lake Michigan, and actually led to seven deaths. Um, so, so that was one of the first in the US that was really well documented. Uh, but they've known about them for quite some time. They didn't start becoming called media tsunamis until much more recently. Um, probably in the 1990s or so, uh, that term was coined. And, and since then, we've learned a lot more about them. 
in part because we have observations now that we didn't have before. We have you know much much more observations of water level observing much more frequently, and so we can you know we can understand these events in ways that you know earlier in the in the in the nineteen hundreds that we weren't able. To. So what are the observations? Are they buoys? Are they gliders? I mean, I know there's a lot of instrumentation out there now. So how do you measure them? So for, for us, we use water level gauges or tide gauges, which NOAA operates throughout the US. We have over 200 of them and, and they collect data in real time and they collect water level observations every minute. And so that's really high frequency observations, which let you really see when a meteor tsunami or, or a seismic tsunami uh, is impacting the coast. Those type of data didn't start collecting that way until the mid nineties. So prior to that, all of the water level observations were once per hour. Uh, and when you had data only once per hour, you couldn't resolve uh, the motions of tsunami events as well. And so most of our tsunami research has started since the mid nineties with, with, with those observations. And then you couple those observations with you know, weather, obviously weather observations, which are much more uh, prevalent across the coast today than they were years ago, and then computer models. So you can run models and better understand how an event in the past might have might have propagated how it was formed things like that with the tide measurements it seems like at that point the meteor tsunami is there is there a warning system in place at all for these so there's been ongoing discussions about that um, at noaa about how we can provide some some advanced warning we do have dart buoys that are offshore um, which are in deep water which many people might know provide a lot of the, the warning information for seismic tsunamis because they, we can detect the tsunami signal before it gets to the coast. Meteor tsunamis <clears throat> are a little bit different because they're not being formed far offshore. So how far offshore are meteor tsunamis? Well, meteor tsunamis usually form close to shore because the weather systems are coming, um, at least on the East Coast, for instance, in the US, weather systems typically come from land and propagate off of shore. And so they'll form in shallower water because that water depth is also the depth that you need to start getting that, that, that uh, resonance that I mentioned before, where you start getting the storm system moving at the same speed as the, the wave. And that happens close to shore on the East Coast. It happens in the Great Lakes, it happens in the Gulf. So they form close to shore. Um, and so for that reason, the buoys that we have offshore for seismic tsunamis aren't as helpful necessarily for, for advanced warning. What we are doing at NOAA though, is, is the weather service now will, will kind of monitor coastal conditions for uh, the, the type of conditions that we know lead to potential uh, meteor tsunami events. And if we detect one in one of our gauges, the weather service will issue uh, <clears throat> a, a statement to let people know that there might be anomalous wave conditions in that region. Is it similar to the way that like water spouts are warned right now? I feel like when there's um, potential for water spouts, the weather service puts out like these special statements, like a coastal statement almost. Is it is it like that? Is that kind of what's in place right now? Yeah, we've issued special weather statements um, for when they've been observed or, or we think they've been detected. Um, but again, in most cases, it's it's most most meteor tsunamis aren't going to be impactful. So it's really just those rare events which happen, you know, usually less than one per year where that warning is really going to be important. Um, and then the other place that, you know, really understanding meteor tsunamis is relevant is during storms that cause significant flooding. Um, so tropical storms, hurricanes, even nor'easters, we've documented that meteor tsunamis can occur at the same time that you are getting flooding from um, those events. And so even though your media tsunami might only be one to two feet tall, well, when you add that to storm surge, you're potentially leading to additional flooding that you might not otherwise expect. So what research are you working on now? Is there any research going on right now on media tsunamis? Yeah, there's lots of people working on media tsunamis across the globe. Um, they're, they're really impactful in, in the Mediterranean, some locations where um, you know they can reach up over 10 feet and really cause significant impact. So there's there's some researchers in Europe that have worked on you know trying to come up with advanced warning systems, modeling approaches to provide guidance on those really large events. Um, in the U.S., <clears throat> in our office, we are working on uh, trying to detect them in real time at our tide gauges. So so 
the approach that we use to look at uh, the record of media tsunamis along the east coast of the U.S., we're basically going to use a similar approach to be, be able to hopefully tell you, you know, right when one of our gauges detects a potential media tsunami, we can provide that notification instead of right now where it's more of a manual approach where someone would have to actually physically look at the data and see the event before it would be noticed. So, so we're hoping to be able to do that, which would enable us to capture events in real time and, and hopefully provide even a little bit more advanced warning in cases that are more extreme. Hey, thank you so much for watching. While you're here, check out some other videos you just may like.